Welcome everybody to this TN2 webinar. Um, TN2 stands for Translational Neuroscience Network. And usually we have meetings where we come together to share our passion and our research findings on neuroscience. But during the COVID pandemic, we have made these webinars. The webinars are in Zoom, which means, um, well, everyone knows the program. But in the webinar session setting, it means that only the speakers and hosts will be visible. So you won't be visible. And uh, you're not able to ask questions yourself, but you can put questions in the Q&A. And in the Q&A, you can also upvote questions if you think someone else has a really interesting question. In the Zoom view, you can also change the size of the slides and the presenter. So you can choose what, uh, well, what size you want to see them. So um, again, welcome. Today I'm the single host as the, uh, the other host has been, um, well, struck by COVID. And that's also the topic of today. Um, Translational Neuroscience Network has been used to translate fundamental and clinical neuroscience. We used to have these annual conferences and we hope to do that in the near future again. And now we have nine webinars in this season, which are focused on research programs of Amsterdam Neuroscience. And today the topic is uh, the Neuroinflammation and Neuroinfection Research Program. We're one of the nine research programs in Amsterdam Neuroscience that focuses on a, a spectrum of diseases. This includes, uh, among others, multiple sclerosis, meningitis, encephalitis, as well as inflammatory neuropathies. We have, well, about 110 experts in these programs, which have internationally acclaimed clinical and translational research and also provide high quality innovative care to patients. Uh, one of our biggest assets are large and unique patient cohorts. And um, well, I'm one of the team leaders together with Jules Killestein and uh, furthermore, Philip Eftimov and Elga de Vries are the task members of this program. Today, um, well, we're going to talk about an important infection and well, maybe also look at the question whether it's a neurological infection. Mariana is going to, uh, Bujan is going to talk about the effect of COVID-19 on the brain. And um, well, as a neurologist, we were also very interested during the initiation of the pandemic, what would be the effect on the brain, whether it would be a neurological infection, uh, whether it could give meningitis or encephalitis. So during the past two years, we've learned a lot. And Mariana is going to talk about what uh, effects under the microscope can be seen of the brain during and after the disease. And subsequently, Zoe is going to talk about a specific patient category with neuroinflammation, multiple sclerosis, and to see how this patient population well behaved during the COVID pandemic and how they responded to vaccines and the disease. So, um, then I'll move to the introduction of Mariana Bugiani. Maybe, Mariana, you can uh, turn on your camera so everyone can see you when, we introduce, when I introduce you. Mariana is a pediatric neurologist who did her training uh, in Italy, in Milan, if I remember correctly. And she came to the Netherlands in 2007 to uh, work together with Mario van der Knaap on uh, uh, leukodystrophies, inherited diseases of the white matter of the brain. And she has become, well, one of the world's most important expert on leukodystrophy uh, uh, in the field of neuropathology. Her research focuses on astrocyte heterogeneity, how the cells lose their physiological functions and acquire pathologic functions, and how this um, influences the disease onset and progression. And um, well, it was interesting to see that during the start of the COVID pandemic, many researchers quickly shifted their original research area and started to look at COVID. And that's also what Mariana did. And uh, what, well, what the results of these efforts were of getting these pathology studies in COVID, she's going to talk with us about in the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then Anita is going to start the presentation. And uh, I would say, Mariana, take it away. Thank you so much. I first of all want to thank everybody of the TN2 network for inviting me to talk about COVID. 
when COVID started, well, two years ago, we immediately took the chance to start doing autopsies on these patients because nothing was known about uh, the pathology of this disease. And the opportunity to study a new disease from scratch was very intellectually uh, challenging. So we immediately began. Next slide, please. And now we had a court. We, start, we call this study the PLATO study. We started in March 2020. Now we have a court of 64 PCR proven patients, 75 of which are men. They are quite uh, uh, not very young, but there are also people in the 30s. And the median disease course is about three weeks. This is range, uh, strongly influenced by what happened in the first wave, in which patients were treated still uh, uh, not as well as they are treated now. And we conduct this study in collaboration with any doctor who is in, interested in this disease. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we do this autopsy very fast in order to collect the tissue that can be used not only for diagnostics, but also for research. And we established a tissue biobank of COVID patients. And the cause of that is in almost half of the cases is COVID-19 related pneumonia. A minority of patients have pulmonary, especially pulmonary embolism or thrombotic events elsewhere in the body. Uh, a little minority of the patients die of a cerebrovascular accident. Many patients after, especially the patients that survive longer, die of multi-organ failure. So failure of the liver, of the heart, of the lungs, and of the kidneys. Next slide, please. The main cause of death in COVID is lung pathology. As you can see here in the lower, uh, left panel, there is a normal lung, but if you look at all the other panels, the lungs are very affected. The, the normal alveolar tissue is substituted by fibrosis, so there cannot be any more gas exchange, and the fibrosis is irreversible. This is why these patients die. There is also a vascular component in COVID, especially again in the lungs, in the form of an endothelitis, so an inflammation of the endothelium of the blood vessels. Next slide, please. But what happens to the brain? We start by taking out the brain and looking at it from the outside. And as you can see, this one was uh, of the, one of the first patients with a very severe COVID-19 related pneumonia. As you can see, his brain is from the outside absolutely normal. Next slide, please. And also on cut, we were not, uh, except in those minority of uh, patients, we were not able to see major morphologic abnormalities, major meaning macroscopic abnormalities. This was a patient of about 75, so the lateral ventricles are a little bit dilated. The hippocampi are not as uh, juicy as they would be in a 25 years old, but you, you can see that the, the brain is more or less normal for the age. Next slide, please. The only thing that we consistently found was a discoloration of the bulbar factoria. You see the two olfactory nerves at the base of the, uh, of the brain, of the frontal lobes in the gyrus rectus. And you see those two enlargements at the end. Those are the bulba olfactoria. And you can see that compared to the nerve, they have a different color. So what's going on in the brain? Next slide, please. It is an infectious disease. So we looked at the innate and adaptive immunity and to uh, mostly try to figure out if this disease may represent a risk factor for accelerating neurodegeneration. And when you look at innate immunity, the first cells that you try to characterize are of course the microglia. Next slide. 
And what we saw, this is the bulbous olfactory of the brain stained for an, uh, uh, with an antibody that uh, highlights activated microglia. We saw that the amount of the number, the density of microglia is largely uh, increased, thus uh, demonstrating a participation of the innate immune response. Next slide, please. The same is to see to be seen, for example, here, this is the medulla oblongata in the nucleus of the tractus solitarius. So what is necessary also for uh, awakening, uh, for uh, 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 taste. And uh, you can see that uh, there is not only uh, uh, activation of the microglia, but these microglia tend to form nodules. And this is typically a sign of massive activation of the innate immunity in the brain. Next slide, please. We also found a very activated microglia in the reticular formation. So explaining why these patients have a loss of consciousness often. Next slide, please. But what is most important is that the whole brain is affected. This is the cerebellum. COVID patients do not have a so predominantly cerebellar signs, but nonetheless in the cerebellum, the microglia is activated and microglia nodules are present. Next slide, please. Now, the microglia are not the only uh, cells involved in the innate immune response in our brain. Astrocytes also play a role are as a, a innate inflammatory cells. And if you look at the astrocytes, next slide, please. You see that they are massively activated. Again, this is a, a staining for GFAP, an antibody that many of you um, use always. This is the medulla oblongata, and you can see that the cell density is increased, but there is also an overlap in the cell processes of these cells, indicating a florid reactive gliosis. Next slide, please. But what happens to the adaptive immune response? Because up to now, we have an innate immune response in the brain, but do we have participation of the adaptive immune response? To see that in the brain, you have to find extravasated lymphocytes. And this is what we did. Next slide, please. And we indeed, especially in the medulla oblongata, found the presence of extravasated T cells. This is a CD3 staining that sometimes even formed the little aggregates. But if you compare the amount of innate immune response to the amount of it, an adaptive immune response, the innate immune response predominates. Next slide, please. Now, one thing that has been, uh, uh, how can I say, published a lot is that COVID-19 patients develop a leukoencephalopathy. So they have <coughs> demyelinating events in the brain that resemble acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And uh, so we also stained, of course, for the myelin. Next slide, please. But found no areas of demyelination in these patients, except in the patients that had the stroke around which the myelin was partially lost. But this is a, an effect of the stroke, a characteristic of the stroke. It could not be categorized as a demyelinating lesion. Next slide, please. Then we looked if it was possible to see virus in the brain. We used diagnostic PCR of brain samples, two kinds of immune histochemistry, and electron microscopy. But we were never in none of these brain able to find the virus. And this is probably due to the fact that even if it's present, it has a very poor viral replication in the brain. Or the alternative, because some people could find it, even though they use diagnostics PCR with up to 200 CTs, so way more deep than what we used for regular we use nowadays for regular diagnostics. But uh, the most uh, uh, featuring characteristic of COVID-19 is the inflammation. 
to the response to the virus. Next slide, please. Now, one thing that we saw consistently is uh, the uh, presence of thrombi in these uh, patients, also in the brain. And they were either regular thrombi made of fibrin and platelets or aggregated neutrophils. And this was very strange to find in neutrophilic plugs because it's something that usually you don't find in viral encephalitis. Even though COVID cannot be categorized as a viral encephalitis, but rather as a uh, para infectious encephalitis. Next slide, please. We found neutrophil extracellular DNA traps being the cause of this thrombi. Now, usually the neutrophils are able to uh, spit out their DNA in order to entrap. Uh, uh, microorganisms. This occurs everywhere in the body, is a very, no, very well known phenomenon, for example, in tuberculosis, but is quite rare in the brain. But on the other side, it is quite often in the COVID-19 brains. And next slide, please. If you look at the staining, this process is automaintains in COVID, Usually, uh, it's uh, resolved within uh, two or three days. In COVID, goes on for weeks. Next slide, please. And if you look at the stainings, these are all brain stainings. Uh, you have a coexistence of red neutrophils with the histone tree in blue. So, spitted out um, DNA in order to, uh, that in the end results in the formation of the thrombus. Next slide, please. So we, in our series of 64 patients, we found no demyelination, very scarce infarcts or hemorrhages in the brain, only in predisposed patients, a massive activation of the innate immune response with a less activation of the adaptive immune response, no cytopathic effect, so different from what we see, for example, in varicella zoster encephalitis, no direct damage of the virus to the cells. The brainstem and the bulbus olfactorius are usually more affected, but all brain is involved. And there is a very good clinical pathological correlation with anosmia, profound hypoxia, and consciousness disturbances. Next slide, please. Now, that was what we gathered during the, the first wave, but then we had other waves, the Delta, the, the Omicron. So we went looking if there were differences in the different waves. And here you have a control on the left of the white and gray matter, the first wave with the activated microglia in the white, but also in the gray matter. And you see that in the following waves, there is a pathologic activation of microglia, but this is never has never been so massive as during the first wave. Next slide, please. And if we compare the uh, markers for uh, in controls and COVID for uh, uh, the different kind of uh, activation statuses of microglia, and we compare them to sepsis, and these are cases that we collected at the Amsterdam UMC of patients who had viral, other forms of viral encephalitis. We see that in most patients, there is an increase of the activated microglia in COVID, even more than in other forms of viral encephalitis. Next slide. If we look at the rest in microglia, this is increased in the viral encephalitis, but is usually decreased in COVID, indicating a massive activation of this cell type. Next slide, please. But this cell type try also to resolve the inflammation because there is an increase in cells that express this epitope CD163 that is an epitope expressed by microglia when they try to become anti-inflammatory. So there is a sort of a repair response in the brain. And this is even more clear in the subsequent waves when compared to the first wave. Next slide, please. 
So we are studying it. We are trying to figure out if the neuropathology is reversible. We on post-mortem CSF established the features of the cytokine storm that might relate to the massive uh, activation of the innate immune response. We are studying the relationship between COVID and Parkinsonism in general. Why we, and we found that, as I showed you, why we didn't find any acceleration in other forms of neurodegeneration like uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we just got a very big Horizon 2021 grant to study the effects on the brain on the long and the post COVID. So if you invite me again in a couple of years, I will be able to tell you even more. Next slide, please. I want to thank uh, the people of the MS group of the pathology department with whom uh, we established, we run this study. And for the Parkinson part, I want to thank Vilma van der Berg of the Anatomy and Neuroscience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariana, for an excellent uh, presentation. Um, anyone at home uh, or at work who's looking at the presentation, please put your questions in the Q&A format uh, on the right lower side. Um, I want to start off with uh, a lot of questions that uh, I had myself during your presentation. I was wondering, is there any viral infection, systemic viral infection that you know that causes a similar pattern of inflammation in the brain, like influenza? Well, or... We looked at the influenza, we looked at parainfluenza, we looked at varicella zoster, we looked at measles, and the pattern is very similar. But the amount, the, the, the entity of the response, of the immune response, is disproportionate in COVID compared to other viral infections. And then the other viral infections also have uh, cytopathic features. So you have, uh, for example, the arteritis of the blood vessels that is typical of the varicella zoster encephalitis. You have uh, meningitis. Uh, you have uh, all these stuff that are completely absent in COVID. Okay, thanks. And um, one question I had myself, but is also one uh, asked by uh, Philip Janssen from the audience, who asked, did you see any differences between different variants of COVID in the neuropathology? Maybe there are not that much uh, Omicron variants yet, but do you no. see... We saw that, that the original variant that broke out in February 2020 was the most, uh, how can I say, pathogenic for the brain. The subsequent variants were less pathogenic for the brain, but we never did a variant analysis. I mean, we never looked in the tissue or in the patients what the variant was infecting that single subject because it was too complicated. And at that time, we didn't have the money to do it. One other possibility is that from the second wave on, the end of the first wave and the second wave on, uh, steroids became uh, the treatment, uh, one treatment of choice in uh, COVID. And steroids hamper the innate immune response. So it could be a combination, the less, uh, how can I say, the less severe features in the brain of the patients between the different uh, waves could be a combination of the variant and the treatment. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question by uh, Susanne Miedema, who's also uh, uh, upvoted by others. And she, uh, first of all, compliments you for an excellent talk, which of course uh, I Thank also you. thought. <laughs> and um, she's wondering if you have an idea when to expect when to expect clinical Parkinsonism effects in those patients who have, well, survived COVID and uh, maybe yeah. the, the depositions? Yeah, this is a very good question. I don't know. What I know is what happened with the Spanish flu, that the peak of Parkinsonism occurred seven, eight years after the pandemic. So we could expect a similar trend. But in this grant that we are running now, we are making organoids of the midbrain in order from COVID patients, in order to see how much, how fast the neurodegeneration goes. 
and uh, to see if it can be stopped by uh, by some kind of treatment. Yes, and um, to to get further uh, into the, the comparison with the Spanish flu. Are there any good pathology studies done in that time that you can compare with? Uh, there are very no results. applications and there is uh, virtually no material anymore available to be studied. No, but they so didn't. We have very old publication in which uh, at that time the microscope still had the candle, didn't have the light. So we had okay. drawings of the brains that resemble what uh, what we see in COVID, but a direct correlation would be great. I mean, it would be also historically be great to do, yeah. but it's not possible. Okay, so uh, there's a question from Tekla van Wageningen. Um, you see an increase in CD163 on microglia. Are you sure that these are microglia or could they also be infiltrating perivascular macrophages? This is a very good question. Uh, we are never sure if uh, uh, a microglia, a cell with microglia features is a monocyte derived macrophage who entered the brain or a resident microglia cells. It's virtually impossible to discriminate. But if you look at the tissue, there are no macrophages. So I would expect these microglia like cells to have the morphology of macrophages if they were infiltrating from the blood. Why they really have the morphology of microglia. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from Anna Maria van Dom, and um, she compliments you on your data and asked whether, uh, because you didn't find virus in the brain, no. uh, can you speculate on what triggers the microglia activation? Is it a systemic infection or it virus it's particles? The, the systemic infection, but mostly the cytokine store. Okay. There is really a massive increase. Okay, we only looked in postmortem tissue, in postmortem uh, CSF. So we did this study with uh, Charlotte Tunison. And we found a massive increase of cytokines and chemokines in this postmortem uh, liquor, also compared to the liquor of patients who died of sepsis, for example. So I think that is really a paramoon phenomenon. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a quite long question from an anonymous attendee um, who wants to ask a basic question regarding fibrosis. You say that the COVID caused fibrosis is irreversible. And um, what do you think that's also the case in patients that are young and recover? Um, and whether, well, that may have a relation with the post COVID syndrome with fatigue and things like that. This is a very good question. The people that recover that we analyze at autopsy months after the COVID because they die of something else, have very little, if any, fibrosis. So I think that those people that, uh, the people that recover develop less fibrosis. And that's the reason for why, for which they don't die of COVID-19 related pneumonia. But the fibrosis okay. in itself is not a reversible, uh, how can I say, mechanism. You have to use drugs to reduce it because you have a proliferation of fibroblasts deposition of collagen and deposition of elastin. And this increases the space between the alveolar wall and the wall of the capillary in the alveolar septa so that the gas exchange is not possible anymore. Okay. Even if you use high pressure uh, uh, intubation. Yes. Um, so there are a lot of questions. Thanks the audience for that. I'm just going to go over the, the most popular ones right now. Uh, one from Jure de Haan that has been upvoted by four other people. Um, well, thank you for your talk. Does the data change your idea on the role of alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease and uh, yeah. diffuse Lewy body dementia? This is a very good question. I don't know yet. We are studying it. And uh, uh, one interesting thing is that we don't see the uh, alpha synuclein in the olfactory bulb, but we see it in the blood vessels of the gut. 
So it looks in between the two hypotheses of the onset of uh, Parkinson's disease, if this will lead to Parkinson's disease, because of course what we see is an accumulation of acetras in nuclein, but none of these patients had signs of Parkinsonism. So uh, what we see would favor the gut to brain hypothesis in, uh, in, uh, instead of the bulbous to brain uh, hypothesis. But I think it's too early to say. Okay. And um, a question from Menno Schoonheim. Um, what do you think is the reason for the microglial activation? I think, well, we, we covered that a bit. And uh, if he understands correctly, it's not viral intrusion into the brain, but so what are they responding to? Well, we, we discussed think, that. Yes, cytokines. Cytokines, yes. And a question uh, by Diederik van der Beek. Um, so there are many different anti-inflammatory treatments right now. Some patients get IL-6 antagonists, some get dexamethasone. Have you been able to look at separate treatments in these patients or are the groups too small? We didn't, uh, we didn't look at that yet uh, because uh, we are, uh, uh, this is a study that we have to do with you, Diederik, and the intensivists because we have to categorize the, uh, the patients first and yep. then see if there is a difference. But we go on collecting these brains also to answer these questions. Yes. Are there any international consortia that, that pull their data from COVID autopsies, brain autopsies? Not well? really. Of course, 70 is nice, but if you would have 400 or something, it yeah, would be I know. even better to, to the, treatment. The, 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 the other country that does a lot, uh, quite uh, uh, a number of autopsies on uh, brain autopsies on COVID patients is Germany. But they stopped lately. They were very active during the first wave and then they stopped. Okay. Now, I have to say that also the requests for autopsies are going down because people say, okay, it's a COVID, we know what the cause yeah. of that is. While clinicians have to go on asking for autopsies because we have to answer still, there are a number of questions that are still unanswered. Okay, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you, Mariana, for answering all these questions. And uh, after the talk of Zoe and uh, her Q&A session, we will get back with the three of us to see whether there are any uh, urgent questions left. So stick, uh, stick with us for that. Okay. And um, so I'd like to continue to our second talk of today. And uh, I'd like to introduce Zoe van Kempen. Zoe is a neurologist who started her training in the OVG and then, uh, well, made a move to the academia where she thrived and, uh, well, had a lot of studies on MS, multiple sclerosis, and uh, mainly on personalized treatment and how we can stop treatments as well. That's done very, very good work. And during the COVID pandemic, she's also one of the people who uh, jumped in to look at the effect of COVID on her patient population, which is, uh, of course, the MS patients. And in the next 20 minutes, she'll discuss what she found during those, uh, well, all their studies. Take it Thank away, you. Zoe. Thank you so much, Matthijs. I will share my screen. Wait. Yes, I hope everybody can see it. Um, yes, I, th I think that's a yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk, Mariana. Um, and uh, my talk is uh, purely clinical. So um, I want to talk uh, chronologically what about what happened um, during the COVID pandemic and what it meant for patients with multiple sclerosis and us as uh, clinicians. So uh, wait. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so two years back, um, COVID really started spreading worldwide. And it was uh, February 27th um, that the first uh, COVID case in the Netherlands was confirmed. 
And I really remember, like, as I think as uh, individuals, we were thinking, uh, what is going to happen? So everybody was watching the news, but as clinicians, um, we were worried. And we also had the feeling that we needed to anticipate for our patients what was going to happen because they were asking us a lot of questions and we need to formulate our questions as well. So what we wondered, I think, um, first of all, the, 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 the most important question was in our population of MS patients, um, do they um, have a, a, an increased risk for a severe course? Um, but also could um, uh, this, this new viral infection influence MS? And especially very interesting if you see what happens in the brain as Mariana was just talking about. Uh, but also, can we protect these patients? Are they, can they build up immunity after infection or uh, vaccination? So these were the first questions that popped into our mind and that we wanted to answer. And we didn't have any information. So we looked back in the history um, to see if we can form hypotheses. So what we know from a very, very old study um, is that in general, MS patients are not more prone for symptomatic viral infections. But nowadays we treat our MS patients or maybe most of our MS patients uh, with immunomodulatory uh, therapies. So we know some are really Im immunosuppressants. So we see more infections, viral infections, but some are not so much like the in interferon beta and glatorimer A state. So then we wouldn't expect really a big influence on that. Um, we know from, I think, quite a lot of studies that viral infections can increase the risk of relapse in MS patients. So MS is an immune modulated disease, uh, mediated disease, and um, we know that patients can have exacerbations, so they will have increase of neurological symptoms for a period of time, and this risk of exacerbations increase when they have a viral infection. And with our medications, we can influence, negatively influence immunity, either after vaccination or infection. So these were, these were things that we knew prior to COVID and that we thought might also count for the COVID infection. Um, so when we talk about MS therapies, when nowadays we have a lot of immunomodulating therapies for which we can choose up. So this, this is a lot and it's increasing, ever increasing over time. So more comes every year. So I don't want you to remember all these medications, but I just want to highlight some medications that during the start of the pandemic, we were scared about that this might increase risk for our population. So um, first is the anti-CD20 therapies. The, the, the most used in MS is ocrelizumab. Nowadays, we also have ofatumumab, but a very other well-known is rituximab, which is also very effective in, in MS. And this is a B-cell depleting therapy. So we give it every half a year through an infusion, and it's very effective, but immunosuppressive. And another group, which I think is a little bit less well known, is the sphincosine 1-phosphate receptor modulator, and then we call it the 1SP uh, modulator. Um, most well known is Fingolimod. And this is B-cell and T-cell depleting. So we were also a little bit scared what is going to happen with that. So we needed information. So now we were in the beginning 2020 and we just needed information. And when I look back, I'm, I'm just so happy and proud of what researchers worldwide did to gather information. So this is just a map of Europe. And I just highlighted some uh, countries which uh, put up uh, registries to um, uh, register information about COVID in MS patients. So really nice that so many people did so much effort to just gather information. And uh, we as well did that, but also um, uh, in the Netherlands, we have the target to be COVID consortium. And Philip, who is now at home and was supposed to be our co-host today, he's the leader of the uh, COVID consortium of the target to be, uh, which was really nice. And it studied of the last two years um, how COVID is evolving and immunity in autoimmune patients. So very uh, large patient group. And I will talk a little bit more about results. Um, so 
with all these registries and for the Dutch registry, um, uh, Floor Loonstra, which is a PhD, she's a PhD student here at MS Center, did some really nice work describing the Dutch patients. But if I have to just highlight one cohort, it is going to be this large, large worldwide cohort described by Simpson Yap. Um, and this is uh, of 28 countries. And this is um, during 2020. So a total of patients of uh, uh, 2,300 patients and most of them are, are confirmed patients because back then not everybody could get uh, easily get a test. So we were looking for um, risk factors for severe COVID in MS patients. And we saw that the general risk factors also uh, applies, uh, applies for um, MS patients, which is higher age, male sex, comorbidity and obesity, but also MS specific risk factors for severe COVID, COVID which is progressive MS, when patients just gradually progress and don't have exacerbations anymore, um, higher invalidity uh, uh, measured on the EDSS scale, and also, again, anti-CD20 therapies. So the B-cell depleting therapies is, uh, is a risk factor for a more severe course. So this was, I think, one of our most pressing questions in, in 2020. But after this question was um, confirmed, um, then we really wanted to start also uh, study immunity. So um, in the first half of 2020, now you cannot maybe, um, well, you can remember, but it's weird that, that somebody would think they have COVID, but they didn't have a test, right? Um, only if you got really severely ill, then you, then you got tested. But we really wanted to study what happened um, if, if MS patients could form SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So what we did in the MS Center, we just tested like over 550 patients for antibodies. And what we, what we, um, the, the results were that in uh, 64 patients, we found antibodies, but in Ocrelizumab, the B-cell depleting therapy, the titer was, was very, very low. So I think this is to be expected because these patients, they are B-cell depleted, B-cells ripe to plasma cells. So they are, they are less able to, to form um, um, uh, antibodies. So this result was also found by many, many others, but also in the Fingolimod group. So this is the, the S1P modulator. So it causes B cell and T cell uh, depletion. We also saw less, less antibody formation. So this is around 2020. And then at the end of 20, uh, 2020, the vaccinations came and we all thought, I thought that it would be over soon. Um, but uh, nothing like that happened. Um, but we were wondering um, how many patients uh, want to get vaccinated. So um, with, again, with the target to b consortium and also Riade, we studied if people wanted to get vaccinated in a very large cohort of autoimmune patients, including 366 MX patients. And we saw that back then, so end of 2020, uh, about two thirds was planning to get vaccinated. One third was still in doubt and uh, like 23% said, um, I will discuss it with my, uh, with my neurologist or a specialist um, and I will listen to uh, him or her, which was really good news for us. And nowadays, many, many patients are vaccinated. <coughs> So after vaccinations, we studied again what happened, um, because obviously vaccination, uh, we wanted to protect our patients from breakthrough uh, infection, but also um, uh, to, to study if they, if they form immunity. And the, the most easiest thing then to study is the, the formation of SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibodies. And again, within the target to be consortium, we saw, I hope you see my mouse, here in the anti-CD20 therapy, that the antibody formation is less. And again, also this was found by many others and also in the Fingolimod group, we saw less antibody formation. And we thought about, because we knew that patients on anti-CD20 therapy also have a risk, increased risk for severe COVID. So then we were thinking about how can we increase the, the antibody um, uh, response? So if you look, because uh, the anti-CD20 therapy is given by inf infusion, as I just told you, uh, once every six months. So imagine if, if this is me and I have about 200 B cells and I get an infusion and they will immediately drop to zero. And then over a course of like six months, I, I maybe have some form of B cell repopulation. And we figured if you vaccinate at the end of that 
that the treatment cycle, maybe you do better. So we studied that again within the target to be consortium. So what we see, wait, yeah, I am in front of what I want to explain. Yes, so what, what we see is when we look at the, the, the normal MS population, so the population without therapy, um, they do quite well uh, with the antibody formation. And um, when we vaccinate the patients, the first vaccination, and when we study the titer after 28 days, and we look at this group, the blue group, which was vaccinated with some form of B-cell repopulation and a vac first vaccination um, um, later in their treatment cycle, they did a little bit better, like 61% so, so showed a zero conversion, but still 40% didn't show zero conversion. So it does influence when we vaccinate, um, but still they do worse. Um, uh, than a uh, than, uh, control population. So when we, uh, I think many people talked about antibodies and uh, also many patients said, I want to have my antibodies tested because then I know if I'm protected, but we still, we don't know how many antibodies are really protective. They, they, they fall over time, it's really hard. And this is really not the only thing that happens after vaccination. Obviously, there's so much more going on immunologically. So antibodies are quite easy to study, but uh, fortunately also the cellular response or the T cell response was studied. And as would be expected in patients on anti-CD20 therapies, they form quite a nice uh, T cell response um, because they have uh, quite, no quite normal T cells. Um, so they, they do not have a lot of antibodies or high uh, titer antibodies, but they do, do form a good um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, specific uh, T cell response. And if we look at other studies, um, they also confirm that ocrelizumab does quite well, anti-CD20, but uh, when we look at the Fingolimod group, so this is also the T cell depletion studies, they do quite worse. So this is interesting. So really a, a group of MS patients that, uh, that we would be worried about. So, oh yeah, so in conclusion, we studied a lot, a uh, lot of uh, immune responses, and we see in uh, MS patients, either on immunomodulatory therapies or without therapies, they are doing comparably to healthy population. Then on the S1P modulators, they have decreased humoral response and cellular response. So decreased antibody response and cellular response. And the anti-CD20 have good T cell response, but decreased um, um, antibody response. But if we look clinically, we know that patients on anti-CD20 therapies, they have an increased risk of severe COVID, but patients on S1P modulators, they are doing the same as, as other patients. So I think this is super interesting because in the lab you can study, but clinically you see something else. So there's a paradox. And we still don't really get that, but something is happening, I think, during the infection that then an immune response uh, does come. So very interesting and something that we ne uh, still need to figure out. Um, so we can study in the lab. That's very important, I think. But in the end, what we want to do and accomplish with our vaccinations is to decrease um, symptomatic and severity of uh, COVID, of breakthrough infections in MS patients. So this is what we want. So now is really the time that we can also study this effect of breakthrough um, disease after vaccination. So a recent report showed, and this is in a lot of patients with immune dysfunction conditions. So also a large group of MS patients. And then they study breakthrough infections and the, the, the gray line in the bottom is the patients without immune dysfunction. And the yellow line is the solid organ transplant. So they had definitely have more breakthrough infections. And then the blue line, this is the MS patients. So they might do a little bit worse with breakthrough infections, but this is a very large study and very nice, but they didn't uh, specify something about medication. You see here on the, on the uh, pre and post vaccination cases um, that the, the severity of COVID is, is getting less. So this is really good. Also in patients with an immune dysfunction and also the severity in the hospitali uh, hospitalization is, uh, is decreasing after vaccination. So that's very, very good. 
And then this is a really recent report. So uh, now I'm at the end of uh, 2021. And this is a, a report by Sormani et al, which uh, she did also a lot of work in Italy on um, COVID-19 in MS patients. And she has a very, very large cohort uh, of MS patients um, and has um, um, antibody titers, as you can see over here, and studied breakthrough infections. Um, and in tw uh, 23 breakthrough infections, you see in 20 cases, uh, the patients were seronegative. So all the patients, I'm so sorry. So all the patients below the red dotted line are without zero conversion. So be below the cutoff. And then we see that, that uh, if, if patients do not have zero converted after vaccination, that it increases the risk for breakthrough infections. But COVID is so, um, oh yeah, so no, uh, I'm not there yet. Um, so then we thought we must bo booster, right? Because um, if they, if they have, don't have antibodies, then they might uh, be more prone for breakthrough infections. So this is October, I think, October 21, um, the, the WHO and also in the Netherlands decided that these patients group on anti-CD20 therapies as 1P modulators should receive an extra booster. And now they have received an extra booster, so their fourth vaccination. So, and what we see in the COVID-19 um, uh, target to be consortium, I hope this is clear for everybody. If we look at the yellow, yellow picture and the light blue picture, we see that if we booster them, which is the, the dotted line over here, um, that there is a slight increase in titer and again, zero conversion, but only maybe about 20%. And the same accounts for the S1P modulators. So it doesn't have a gigantic effect, just a little effect. And this is also here shown in another study, which is the, 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 the second vaccination and the third vaccination. Um, and here they see it's like a 20% increase of zero conversion in the anti-CD20 group and the Golimut group is, is very little. So nowadays, because, oh, sorry, my Siri is going off. Um, so nowadays, COVID is going so fast, right? So every time we think we have a very nice research question, we want to research it and study it, and then it already changes and <laughs> all our results don't apply anymore. Because, because now we have Omicron since uh, late December. Um, and now we see almost 99% of infections in the Netherlands is with this variant. And we know that it is very, uh, it spreads super fast, but that it, it doesn't give as much severe infection as, as we had with the other variants. So this is good news. Um, and we also know that with this variant, it's extra important, that's what Nemeth et al. described, uh, to booster, because then it really increases the protection of the vaccination. So one would say, maybe this is nature's solution. Uh, Omicron is a blessing. Um, so I think, yes, maybe indeed for the general population, but still, does this also account for the MS patients, for the MS patients with immunosuppressants? I think that is something we still have to study, that we are studying at the moment with the consortium to see if also in this patient category, um, the severity of COVID with Omicron is less, if they are also protected from severe diseases by the third and fourth vaccination. So this is something that will come. Um, and I hope then that, um, that we don't need to do so much COVID research anymore, well, Mariana, for the, for the long-term effects. But then for the clinical point of view and the clinical infections, I really hope this will be the end, but we will see. Uh, otherwise, we will keep on researching. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Zoe. You must have spent so much time on Zoom and Teams with all these consortia, probably. Yes. <laughs> so with the with the COVID consortium, it was a weekly a weekly meeting. Um, so you really get to know each other every Thursday. Um, so it's too bad that Philip isn't here. Uh, but yes, uh, a lot of time, but also a lot of brainstorming. And I think it's really nice to just keep on asking new questions and evolving. I'll stop sharing, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, there, there have been some questions uh, from the uh, audience already, um, mm. and I'd like to urge everyone that if you have any questions, please put them, put them in the Q&A. There was a, a question from Wouter Meyer who asked whether uh, any of the patients on MS wanted to stop their immunosuppressive medication because of COVID. Yes. 
<laughs> Very good question. And I think super important clinically, uh, especially in 2020, we had, uh, we had patients that said, oh no, I've quit three months. And then we said, no, don't do that. But in the beginning, um, one of the, 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 the like more normal medication, they can uh, sometimes give lymphopenia. And then we thought, oh, this might increase COVID. So then we altered the, the, the dosage and we did all sorts of strange things. Um, and, and maybe one day, yes, one day, no. Uh, and in the end, we saw it, that it didn't affect at all the disease severity. But yes, patients wanted to quit. Um, we did extended dosing with the anti-CD20 therapies for a full year. Um, uh, lots of things like that, because we just didn't know and we were scared. Yeah, and another question was about a, a recent Norwegian study on the third COVID vaccination, but I think you covered that during your presentation, the effect of the boosters. So yeah, I was yeah. puzzled That's a limited. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I was puzzled a bit. Um, you have this, I'm not sure whether it is a paradox, but in COVID, the, most of the damage, as Mariana showed, is done by the immune response. So why don't people with a, a lowered immune response have milder symptoms? Yeah, yeah, that's, I think it's a very, very good question because uh, we speculated in the start, th this as a possibility, um, that, that might, because the cytokine storms might be lowered. And for some medications, uh, such as interferon beta, which is also studied in COVID and also uh, therapy in MS, we see um, some patients uh, and some evidence that they do better because it has antiviral capacities. For the, the, the immunomodulating therapies, the CD20, which is uh, forming a risk for more severe COVID, we see that these patients, they just, um, they cannot clear the virus as well. Um, so I think it doesn't really influence the cytokine storm, but it does influence the, the neutralization of the, of the virus. Okay. Uh, and there's a question from Arjen Brussart. Um, is there any information about the antibody response on uh, MS patients that had COVID-19? So, well, you covered quite a lot of that, I guess. And what's known about the risk of MS patients getting ill from Omicron? Is that already known? Yes, well, that is uh, something... Um... No, there's there's nothing written about that, but obviously we have like uh, 2,000 patients here in the MS center. So clinically, we see that these patients also when they use anti-CD20 therapies, also when they are older, they are doing quite well, just as the normal population. But uh, we want to really um, also write it down and with the target to be consortium, um, this is something that we're figuring out at the moment. So um, very nice, large patient. Work in progress. Also. Yeah, work in progress. But what we see clinically is that uh, indeed in Omicron, also MS patients are not so sick. So it is really good. Okay. And um, well, here at the AMC, we had quite some MS patients, which we usually don't see, who came in for antibody treatment yeah. because they were on Fingolimod. And then we first had to measure the antibodies and then administer them. But um, if I remember when it switched to the Omicron wave that was useless at once. Yeah, so um, there, are, there are multiple uh, monoclonal antibodies which we can give to patients do, who don't have antibodies um, by themselves after vaccination. Um, so this is something that we did give and then Omicron happened and then these antibodies didn't work anymore. So now we have a new antibody which is called Sertrovimab uh, which is also now available at the, at the, at the Amsterdam UMC, uh, which we can now give also to these patients, which is probably effective. Um, but now we have Omicron, so it doesn't really, it's not so necessary anymore, we see, because patients don't really get so sick. So that's good. And would you say you would reserve that for patients who get admitted from COVID infection? Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. With having the risk that you're a bit too late. Yes, but what I, I think um, because we have a quite large group of patients without antibodies and now we have so many patients getting ill from Omicron um, and obviously our patient group is really a young group. So they are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, mostly. So they have mostly they don't have any comorbidities. And then I would say if we if we treat that entire group, then the, the, the Soterovimab will be out, I think, in weeks. Um, so, and, and up to, until now, our, 
our experience with that group is that they really do quite well. But if we have somebody on and CD20 who has comorbidities, who's older, then definitely we will consider. Yeah. So, and why are there not that many 50, 60, 70 year old MS patients? When they're older, we're not treating them so much with these um, uh, with these medications because these medications um, they really um, suppress the inflammatory state of the patients. And when we we see with MS that it, with age increases in large populations, they get less inflammatory. They get more neurodegenerative. So then, for older patients, we won't treat them as much with medications like ocalizumab and fingolimod. Okay, so there's a question from uh, Jure de Haan. Terrific work, Zoe. Uh, is an Omicron infection in your eyes sufficient to lead to an MS exacerbation, given yes. the often described asymptomatic disease, asymptomatic disease course? And how do you see the role of steroids in such a case? Yeah, um, I think it's a super good question. And uh, something I didn't cover in my talk, uh, but indeed the Omicron, but also the other variants, uh, well, for, for Omicron, we, we don't have so much data now, uh, but for the other variants, we know that it, this can uh, increase or this increases the risk of an exacerbation. And then it was also for Omicron, I think maybe it's not so bad to, to, uh, to also treat with, uh, with steroids, but for the other infections, it was because then you give very high dose of steroids. And obviously we also give steroids in COVID, but we didn't really know what to do. We know when you give high doses of steroids and you get um, infected afterwards, that you, it also increases the risk of severe COVID. Um, so yes, it increases, COVID infection increases the risk of an exacerbation, and we didn't really know what to do, but if it was really severe, um, the, the exacerbation, then we would um, uh, treat with uh, steroids, yeah. Okay, and there's a question from Marleen van Eyck. What's the advice uh, regarding anti-CD20 therapy and CD19 levels in follow-up for timing of next dosage? Yeah, very good question. We, um, nobody knows, um, but what we did in, the, um, in 2020 was that we allowed um, uh, repopulation until uh, 10 B cells per, per liter, which is like this, uh, which we thought, okay, this is a first sign of B, B cell repopulation. And then we gave it the next dose, but we didn't, we, we thought about it. We, we thought that it mustn't get too high, but we saw that patients could really extend their dose for maybe two months, maybe three months, uh, which we did back then, yeah. Okay, so those are uh, all the questions, and I think it's also, uh, well, 10 to uh, or 20 past one, which is the time you had from uh, for your questions. I'd like to invite Marianne back. Uh, one question, uh, question was dismissed, that was from Diederik, who uh, said it was a great talk, but it was not a question, so he didn't make it. But <laughs> um, So... I had a question for you both. Do you know of a case of an MS patient who died from COVID who uh, was autopsied? I was going to ask Marianne that. <laughs> I don't. I, I no. don't. No, because uh, we usually get the MS uh, autopsies via the brain bank, the Dutch brain bank, and they decided not to, to do autopsies for safety reasons on the patients that are COVID positive. Do you still need to take specific precautions for the COVID autopsies? Yes. For infection risks? We have to dress up a little bit more. Uh, we use, instead of a surgical mask, uh, we use an FFP3 mask. But after all these autopsies, no one got infected. So it's not that uh, dangerous. No. Well, it's also not to be expected, maybe, I mean, from a right, respiratory the virus. It's the same precautions that we take for tuberculosis or for HIV or for hepatitis. Uh, Okay, so I'm just, there were some questions left for Mariana, which I think maybe we can uh, discuss some more. Um, whether the age of the patient who died was related to the, the amount of uh, pathology you observed? No? no. And I, I also had a question whether the, the, the cause of death was related to the, the, the brain. Yes, all related to the brain. Only in two cases oh. we found the cause of death related to the brain. One was a patient with an uh, acute necrotizing encephalopathy and COVID. 
So saying what is the chicken and what is the egg was difficult in this patient. And one was a patient who had already had a stroke and had a second stroke during COVID and died of, uh, of this massive bleeding. But uh, all the other patients did not die of uh, brain-related disease. Okay, so uh, a novel question has popped up. Uh, since it's unclear if COVID has brain tropism or not, and if the hypothesis of it being cleared very fast and replicating slowly in the CNS is true, um, sorry, it's difficult to make out the question. Are the patients unable to clear COVID? No, sorry. There's a question about the presence of um, COVID in the brain, but I think, well, that's a, there's just not that much evidence to, um, oh. to confirm that. Okay, and um, so Mariana, you're going further with COVID and you'll be probably be doing COVID for years. Are you going back to, uh, to MS soon, Zoe? Or you just um, stuck with MS? Well, uh, yeah, yes, <laughs> um, we're doing uh, two things at the time, and I think it will um, it will develop by by itself because um, I, I I remember in um, beginning 2020, and we did a lot of work of uh, of testing these MS patients for antibodies, and I remember my mom saying, "So much work, and it will all be over soon." <laughs> So, um, but it didn't. And I think, um, as also Mariana pointed out, it will be very interesting to further study. And for a cl clinical point of view, we'll, we will be guided what happens. Yeah. And so I have to tell you that if you have patients with MS that die of COVID and you want to get, it, uh, uh, get an autopsy, you just call us. Yes. Okay, Mariana, yeah. I will. Yeah. Luckily, I haven't had anybody who died. So that's good. And Mariana, I guess if someone dies right now of any cause, there is like a 60% chance they had COVID. Yes. So would it be interesting to look for COVID associated pathologies in random patients you get for autopsy? We do it. Uh, we always do it now. Every autopsy is screened for COVID. Maybe we don't do the test anymore. Okay. But uh, we look at the, the main organs that are affected, the, the lungs, especially the heart and the brain, which are the three organs that are more affected by COVID. And we always keep in mind that it might be COVID related. Okay. Um... Oh, sorry. I, a question came back and it well, disappeared again. So there's one from uh, Susanna Minima for Mariana. Is there a maximum time between COVID infection and brain autopsy that you think is still relevant to investigate? No, I think that is always, uh, we must just, uh, we just must go on looking at it because we cannot expect what's gonna happen. And then the correlation studies are gonna be complicated because as you yeah. say in the, in your questions, the older you get, the more disease you accumulate. So describing what might be related to COVID or non-COVID is uh, it's gonna be uh, difficult. But by screening in these first years, the patients that have had, for example, the COVID during the first and the second wave for neurodegeneration is very important because it tells you in very young patients, if this uh, infection is really a risk factor or not in accelerating these diseases. So, and then later it's gonna be, uh, so we have to define now if there is pathology already, prodromic pathology, if the prodromic pathology is different from the prodromic pathology that we know in other, in the classical form of diseases, and then use this information to discriminate what might be COVID related later in the years to come. Because as I said, for example, the alpha synuclein accumulation in the blood vessels is something that is uh, almost never seen in the regular part, in the pre-COVID Parkinson, and in the pre-COVID prodromic Parkinson, while it's a constant finding in the COVID related, in the, in the COVID cases. Do, do you have any biomarkers in blood that reflect the amount of uh, well, alpha synuclein deposition 
It's well, you can measure alpha synuclein liquor, and uh, oh. it's something that we are going to do. Okay. But we wanted to do it on post mortem liquor because yes. uh, we want to correlate it to the pathology. Yes, well, we, we have some CSF from live patients if you want yes. to correlate it to uh, those ones. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'd like to thank you again. And I'm just going to start sharing my screen again to, uh, well, tell everyone about the uh, next uh, TN2 webinar. That's going to be the 17th of uh, March, and it's going to be on brain imaging. And uh, we had a very good attendance today. I'd like to thank everyone who uh, stuck around till the end and for all your interests. And um, uh, you can, if you really enjoyed it you can see it again on youtube or tell your colleagues about it and they can look at it and uh, i'd like to thank everyone and um, see you at the next session <laughs>